Good morning, guys. This is Pastor Greg here with the God Standard, exposing spiritual roots of disease, part three. So we're just uh, in a series, and we're we're talking about uh, several issues, and and these are important issues because as 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 time progresses, um, you know, we're seeing more sickness, more disease manifesting, uh, you know, in society. Obviously, um, you know, we're we're still dealing with the effects of COVID, but you know, we're seeing other sickness and disease that you know, are things that are happening now that weren't happening 10 years ago. When I, when I send my kids to school and the, the peanut allergies are something that kids can grow out of, but it seems like it's just been in excess in the last couple of years. And there's this law of multiplication that's happening. And, and we have to, uh, you know, come to the realization, you know, that when the Bible says above all else, I wish that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, we are a triune being. We're created spirit with a soul in a flesh suit. That's how we're created. Oftentimes, when we look at a problem in the flesh suit, we want to look for a flesh problem, right? And what we're seeing is between 80 and 87 percent of sickness and disease is rooted in the soul region, right? So I want to go ahead and I want to go back through some things because, you know, when, when we do deliverance here in the church, and uh, not everybody online has been through it, but here's where I'm seeing, and I know Jen, you know, should agree with it, uh, not making you, uh, and, and Kristen, probably I would say over 90% of the people that go through deliverance that come into uh, our house or wherever it is that we're doing it, they manifest some type of, of uh, sickness or pain in their body when we're dealing with a spirit of infirmity. And so we've made a protocol at the very end of, of deliverance. It's like, hey, if we broke every chain that would tie the demonic to a believer's life, um, you know, it could be hardship, could be poverty, could be sickness, disease, you know, whatever. Once all those chains are broken, then we immediately call out spirit of infirmity. And I'm saying over 90% of the time, all of a sudden, these people have pains going in their body that they did not have or notice when they first walked into the house or in their life. And this is something that we address when we get it out. And, you know, my, my rationale is that one is, once a seed is, is planted, you know, the seed's goal is to move to a harvest, right? Every seed wants to move to a harvest. And I believe we're disrupting that harvest and we're probably getting things that are in the early stages because we're breaking those chains and, and you know, obviously forgiveness is happening. So we're breaking the, the ties, the entanglements and the attachments to someone else's life. But all of a sudden, those pains and those things are leaving. But I believe that those are seeds prior to a harvest that we're being able to deal with that they're not going to be able to deal with in their life. But it is interesting when we deal with the soul condition, then flesh pain shows up, right? So there is a correlation. And that's the reason that we're going down this path. Um, I'll, I'll give another story. A couple of weeks ago, I went over to a guy's house that had MS. Um, and he was, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty messed up. And I went over there with Cliff and we ended up praying for the guy, talked talk with the guy for a little bit, but I could tell that he was withholding. Obviously it's a new relationship. He didn't know me that well, didn't want to tell me everything, but I ended up praying for him. And he said, for the first time, he had tingling going down his legs because he he's in a, he's wheelchair bound. And he said he had tingling in his legs. And that's as far as I was able to get him. And, you know, I talked to him for a little bit, said, Hey, we're going to do a follow-up then I start reading about autoimmune disorders. And that's what I talked about last week. And autoimmune disorders, I said, it's no strange thing that your body, when you start hating yourself through guilt, shame, condemnation, and I'm going to address that, through guilt, shame, and condemnation, you start hating yourself. Is it any coincidence now the flesh is following the condition of the soul and the condition of the spirit? You begin to hate yourself, and all of a sudden now your body begins to attack itself through an autoimmune disorder, MS is one of them, celiac disorder, Crohn's disease, you know, IBS. There's several issues where your body turns on itself and starts attacking itself when you are in a place where you hate yourself. So I called Cliff and I immediately read about self-hatred. And I said, the reason he has MS, and he told me he had MS after he confessed that he was sick, that God would get him out of a job that he absolutely hated. And as soon as that happened, MS hit. And he's the second person that had MS, that MS hit their body after a negative confession or a self-curse over their lives. And I thought, wow, 
So I'm seeing cycles. Now, obviously, we got to go back over to his house and we have to pray for him. But I immediately texted Cliff and I said, Cliff, this all started through self-hatred. So we got to find out what are the incidents, what happened? Why does he hate himself? And if he hates himself, then he can't love God because he doesn't love himself, right? So there's a disruption in Matthew 8, 39 and 40 says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So anyways, that's just a side note. So um, like I said, every seed demands a harvest. And in Genesis 1 and 12, it says the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit uh, in which is their seed according to its own kind. And God thought it was good. I'm going to go ahead and put the notes up here. So we know that we know that when God created something, he put seed in it to reproduce itself. So if we were created in the image of God and we were created by the love of God, we were created to manifest his love, which is our seed here in this earth. Genesis 1.26, not only did God give us seed, but in Genesis 1.26, God gave us dominion and authority, right? So I'm not going to go through every single verse. And in that dominion and authority, Genesis 2 and 20, it says Adam gave names to every living creature. What did the name do? It gave it purpose. What is the name of sickness and disease? It gives it purpose. When we accept sickness and disease and we accept the name of it, we accept its assignment in our lives, right? And so the doctor may say, hey, you have this. And I may say, I understand what you're saying, but in my innermost being, I'm going to reject it because it was already taken to the cross. Jesus already died for the curse of the law. So it's the very thing that I now know what I need to pray for, but I'm always going to find out how did that get in. Now watch this. So when I go to a doctor, and if a doctor says, you know, I have symptoms, let's just say of cancer, what are they going to ask? They're going to ask the, um, you know, from the people that came before me in previous generations, did they carry this and what were their symptoms? They always ask that. Christian, do they ask that? To fill out a questionnaire of symptoms that run through your body? Yeah, like do your parents have hypertension, cardiac disease, any of that? Um, diabetes. Okay. So they're going to ask that, but now watch this. Do they ever ask why your parents got it? No. It's, 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 it's rhetorical. So they never ask why your parents got it. So they don't even know why your parents had it. All they can do is connect the dots and say, well, if your parents had it, then you have it. Why? Because there's something genetic that's supposed to pass down to you, but they don't know why my parents had it. So they never resolved it in my parents' life. So how are they going to resolve it in my life? The only thing they can do is they named it in my parents' life. So now we're going to name it in your life, but they've never discovered the cause of it, right? And so that's where, you know, we break generational cycles. Generational cycles travel up to four generations. Sexual sin go to 10 generations. But the cross of Jesus and the blood of Jesus redeems us from that and gives us freedom. So let's move on. So my base scripture <coughs> is in Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30. And I kind of went ahead of myself. Um, I've covered this before, but I want to go a little bit in depth. And obviously, I have my Bible turned to Mark, so it doesn't help me. So Matthew 13, uh, 24 through 30 says, Jesus presented another parable to him. Now, understand that Jesus already talked about the parable of the sower. Parable of the sower for me is a cornerstone parable of all parables because it talks about the acceleration of a seed. It starts talking about a seed that's planted beside the path. So there's no fruit in it. Then there's a little more fruit when it lands on the rocky soil. Then there's a little more fruit when it lands among the thorn and the thistle. And then it says after that, it's 30, 60, and 100 fold. So there's a progression that it's talking about. I think it's interesting before the progression of 30, 60, and 100 fold, there's going to be a light kind seed that's going to be planted along the word of God. There's going to be a counterfeit. I call it the, um, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes in the, in the pride of life. But we're going to get into that. But I think it's interesting. So after this parable, Jesus talks about the process of a seed and what it decides to do if it gets deep down in your heart. So the, the seed is not the determining factor for growth. It's the soil, right? It's the heart condition. That's the determining factor. The Bible says, uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's in Proverbs 23 and 7. So as you think about who you are, what you are, that is where, uh, that is what is going to be produced in your life. You cannot live beyond your heart condition. If you only see yourself as so far in life, and all of a sudden you're jumped up to here, 
you have to sabotage your life to bring it right back down to here. And that's why I always say preparation brings the burden of tomorrow today. So you start preparing for it, but you'll never exceed the expectation or the capacity that you've already set forth in your heart. So as you grow in your heart, the atmosphere around you is going to grow, right? So let's, let's continue on. So we have this parable of the sower. Now, the parable of the sower is talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So I'm going to pull from all three of them because everybody had a different perspective, but they're all the same, the same purpose and the same intent. So it says in verse 24 in Matthew 13, Jesus presented another parable to them. Uh, he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the land over came to him and said, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How does it have tares? And he said to him, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. And he, then he said, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And then it talks about in the end times, that there's going to be a separation of the two. But before anything happens out in the open, it's going to happen in the individual, individual's life. So I'm going to take that principle and I want to talk about that principle about a seed being manifest either for health sake or obviously sickness and disease. But we have to understand these causes. So we know that in Genesis 20, I said that Adam gave names to the livestock, right? And we know in Genesis uh, 2 and 21, it said that it wasn't good for man to for Adam to be alone. So what did he do? So it says that the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it, uh, closed, closed up its place with flesh. So hold on a second. So man slept, right? And I just talked about a parable where man was sleeping. So man slept. And while Adam slept, God brought something from out of Adam, right? So God brought something from out of Adam, Adam when he was sleeping. The place of sleep is a place of rest. The place of rest is also a place of meditation. Faith is exercised best in a place of rest. But guess what? Let's flip it on the other side. Fear is also uh, most effective when you're in a place of rest. Look at the people that you see on Facebook, the people that have anxiety, depression, they have insomnia, they can't sleep at night. They're in a place of unrest and they don't understand the cause as to why. Let's go ahead and get to the root of it. So in Matthew 13 and 25, it said, By while, but while everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and slipped away. Now, Jen said this last week, and I don't have it in our notes, but it says in the book of Genesis, it says that, let's go all the way back to Genesis 3. It said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Hold on a second. It says, but while everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among them. And it said, and he slipped away. So we have a subtle enemy with subtle thoughts and a subtle attack. But you have to understand when, when the spirit realm looks at, at humanity, humanity through Jesus has given authority to create here on this earth. So the spirit realm looks at you as a garden. And if that spirit realm can get a seed in your life, then you have been given the power and authority to manifest it here on this earth. So you serve the agenda of the God of this world or, or the God of the kingdom of God, right? So you serve one or two agendas based on what's being sown in your heart. So it says that there's creation while a person is sleeping. And then um, it says in Mark 4, 26 and 29, let's talk about this seed. And he was saying the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. Watch this. We're talking about an enemy planting something and, and sneaking away, but now let's flip it back to the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. This is in the book of Mark. This was written right after the parable of the sower also, you know, but this one's in the book of Mark. And, he, and it says, uh, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up daily, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. So he doesn't understand the process because that's not his job anyway. Our job is to sow. It's God's job to grow. So he does not know. But here's what he knows. The soil produces crops by itself. So the power is in the soil, right? Not in the seed. So it says the soil produces crops by itself. First the stock, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. 
Now, when the crop permits, he immediately puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. So there is a process of a seed. Every seed demands a harvest. Did you hear me? Every seed, good and bad, demands a harvest based on what's been sown. So again, I'm not going to keep it real complex to them. I'm going to keep it real simple. Now, watch this. Let's talk about sleep and let's talk about a place of creativity. I'm going to flip it back over to evil. Ephesians 4 and 26 is be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because when you go into the place of rest, you're going to produce the very last thing that was on your mind, which is anger, right? Which is bitterness. It's all rooted in fear. But when you go to sleep in a place of fear, you're going to create the very thing that fear demands, which the end result, it starts off in the spirit, but the end result is sickness and disease. And that's the very thing that you're going to create in your life. That's why you have to get these things resolved before you go into a place of rest, because the place of rest is a place of creativity in your life, right? So I put in here, the soil is a source of growth, not the seed. The realm of the spirit sees you as a garden with the power to create. Um, the place of rest is a place of creation. And we have to then talk about if things are being sown, if things are being grown, then we have to talk about the power of thinking. So how does God speak? Well, we know, you know, there's three voices that come in our life. It's God's voice, the devil's voice, it's my voice. Well, what does God's voice sound like? You know, God's voice is a spontaneous thought, picture, and emotion. It hits you like a train wreck. A lot of times we're not expecting it, but it'll hit us sideways. And how do I know it's between my voice or God's voice? Usually, now think about this. Usually I'm going to rationalize the previous voice that came in my life. What am I rationalizing? I'm going to rationalize. Now, every thought that comes in your life, it comes in the form of a seed. Think about this now. Every thought that comes in your life has a purpose of creation. What are you meditating on? You're trying to create something, you know? Well, I'm meditating on my bills. What are you meditating on? The problem. Well, the more you meditate on the problem, the bigger the problem gets. But what are you ultimately trying to meditate on? I'm trying to figure out how to create a way out of my problem, right? Now, either God's going to jump on that with a promise. Either you're going to read the word of God or you're going to get a word from God. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds on the mouth of God. Or you're going to allow your problem to speak through the voice of the enemy. Now, watch this. So God speaks through spontaneous thoughts, pictures, and emotions. And what are we trying to get? We're trying to get a renewed mind. We're trying to get perfection going in your life. Well, what does that look like? Well, you have a short-term and a long-term memory. In order for, uh, for long-term memory to be engaged, short-term memory is engaged first. Well, what does that look like? You have to hear six things in order for, out of that six things that are spoken to you repetitively, only 25% is actually regained and it becomes part of a long-term mem memory. Remember when I talked about your brain has a reticular activating system and they're like algorithms like on Google? When you first think of a new thought, all of a sudden a pathway is formed. And the more you think about that, the deeper that thing goes. If you ask me about healing and deliverance, I told Jen this, I said, it's in my bones. What are you talking about? This thing is in so deep in me, I am convinced it's God's will to heal. Why? Because I've experienced the truth in that realm. And I think about this all the time. So it is a stronghold. God's redemptive power in my life is a stronghold. I don't even freak out when people need prayer because I know God's going to show up. Why? Because I have so much experience and I have so much time thinking and meditating on these things. I know with everything in me that God's going to show up. People with anxiety and depression flip-flop the exact same way. They know everything is going to go bad in their life. They've ingrained it deep down. But science has proven, Caroline Leaf talks about it, that a renewed mind to the Word of God, because the Word of God is so powerful, can be transformed and rewired within 48 hours. Did you hear me? Within 48 hours, your brain will rewire itself. Now it's going to take habits to reform. Um, it takes at least 30 days for your habits to line up with an, a renewed mind, but they'll eventually follow in suit. It's, it's the spirit, um, the, um, it, the soul that's set on the spirit is life and peace. So, or the mindset, but it's your soul that's set on the spirit is life and peace. So there has to be a renewed mind. So we're going to go ahead and talk about that. But anyways, so we have short-term uh, memory and we have long-term. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reprogram the long-term memory. The long-term memory is the stronghold in our heart. It's the very thing that we perceive as truth in our life, right? So when we read something enough, it gets ingrained in us. So we're talking about God's voice. God will speak an instruction. 
When God speaks an instruction, we know that grace enables what it commands. When God speaks, he's releasing also an ability to do the very thing he's talking about, right? So when God speaks, he is commissioning us. He is uh, giving us authority over the issue, and he's giving us authority through the ability in his instruction. Now, when the enemy speaks, and when God speaks, uh, it's to strengthen, encourage, and comfort us. So how do I know God's speaking? Usually that peace, you know, comes upon me, but that voice that I will correlate, even if it's emotion, it's always going to strengthen me. <coughs> it's going to encourage me. It's going to comfort me. Okay, that's God's voice. What does the enemy's voice do? It's going to come to kill, steal, and destroy. What is it going to do? It's going to plant a seed of fear. These are all seeds, whether it's God or the enemy. And what's the recourse? My meditation. So the very thing I'm rationalizing are the voices that have already come in my life. <coughs> now, I have to discern which one's God and which one's the enemy. Why? Because I have a filter in my heart. It's called discernment, right? Uh, discernment is, is, uh, is a spirit of faith. And suspicion is a spirit of fear, right? There's people that say, I know you, you know, and start accusing. It's like, is this discernment or suspicion? Well, are you standing in fear? Or are you standing in faith? It will determine what your lens is. A lot of times people will accuse, you know, and, and call it God. And it's not discernment, it's suspicion. Why? Because they have fears in their own lives. So fear is the lens that they see everything else through. So you've got to be very careful who you allow to speak in your life based on the position, <coughs> to, excuse me, that they have in fear of faith. So let's move on. We have God's voice, we have the devil's voice, and we have our voice. All the voices, the voice of God and the voice of the enemy is going to cause meditation in our lives. And if God, and I'm not picking up on the voice of God, guess what? I'm going to read the word of God, and I'm going to get God's voice in my life. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, how does this apply to my life? I don't want to just read the word. I want to experience it. You, you heard uh, uh, Pastor Darren on Wednesday. He goes, if I call you to preach, guess what? I'm also going to expect you to demonstrate it. When I minister, I don't want to just give a word. Oh, I got this great revelation. Because unless I experience it, it's just a theory. And I don't want to hand out a bunch of theories. You know, if I talk about, you know, deliverance, then guess what? I'm probably going to lay hands on the sick. Why? Because I want you to experience deliverance. If I talk about healing, what am I going to do? I'm going to lay hands on you. I want you to experience it. I want the Holy Spirit to move and solidify that thing in your life, right? The mark of a child of God is the power of God. So I want to make sure that you get it. The Bible says that wisdom is proved right by the children of God. The proving is that revelation has already been through the fire. And the child of God can take that revelation into someone else's life and actually give them breakthrough. You move as God's fire in that situation. You're the one bringing the breakthrough because the revelation you carry has already been proven. Why? It's already stood the test uh, of, of every storm that has tried to come in your life, and it still stands. So when you have that type of revelation, then obviously you want to be able to carry it in somebody else's life. That's why when, when instead of reciting scriptures, you know, when it says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free in John 8, 32, a knowing is speaking about an experience. So it's saying when you experience the truth, that experience will make you free. It's not just hearing it, it's experiencing it. It's living it is what is going to make you free. Because here's the thing, theories can be challenged, but they cannot take away your experience. I've had so many experiences in God that did not make sense. And I couldn't deny that it wasn't true. My call to the ministry was in a grocery store. I had an experience, a two-day experience with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I could not, and I was raised Catholic. It did not line up with any limited theology that I had, but I could not de deny the experience. So when I had an experience, I had to go back to the Bible to really understand what that was, right? My call to pray for the sick. Jesus showed up on my sleep. How do you deny that experience? Prayed with Smith Wigglesworth in her dream. How do you deny that experience? You know, and, and uh, a 19-year-old comes into church. I know he's a spirit-filled believer, and he's manifesting demons. Well, everybody, you're not everybody. A lot of people argue Christians can't be demonized. Okay, well, I had this experience. Then you explain it. And of course, they say, well, he wasn't really saved. I don't, I'm not sure I want to stand on that side of the fence and judge who's saved and who's not saved, right? He confessed that Jesus is Lord. He's been to all the youth uh, gatherings. He's been in church. I know he's saved. And all of a sudden, trauma hits his life, and now he's manifesting demons. So what am I talking about? I have to go back to God, and I have to say, hold on a sec. I had this experience. And 
the theology did not line up. But then I started reading about the children's bread. Then I started asking myself, well, who did Jesus cast demons out of? It was the church because he would not do anything. It's first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So he was doing something in the church. So he was casting demons out of Christians. Yes, he was. He cast a spirit of infirmity out of a woman who has been over for 18 years. It made special note that she was a daughter of Abraham. So hold on a second. She had an evil spirit in her body. He prayed for her. And not only did she get healed, the Bible makes special note that she's a daughter of Abraham. Why did it make special note? Because deliverance is for the Christians. Why is it for the Christians? Because when the Christian gets free, they have the power through the cross to stay free. And if you're not a believer, it's called an exorcism. You cannot stay free. That's why it's going to re-enter into the house in which it left. Anyways, got a little bit off the beaten path. So we're talking about the voices that are coming in our life. So everybody seeks information, whether it's good or bad. And Jen and Kristen, you can jump in here at any time. Everybody seeks information when it's good or bad. When you go to the doctor, you want to find out, even if it's cancer, I just want to know what it is, you know? And usually whatever information comes out, that's the thing that they receive in their heart. You know, if that person says cancer, I recently lost a friend to cancer. He put a post on Facebook. He said, F cancer. All of a sudden, a few months later, I see all these posts. And he passed away. I was like, wow, his attitude showed me he was going to beat it. I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but you hear the word cancer and then you automatically correlate it to, well, he's going to die. And why do you co correlate it to that? It's based on the thoughts and the truth that you already have in your life. Now, I see it as a kingdom opportunity. Jen, go ahead. You got your hand in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to share something with you because you were talking about what uh, your voice says. Um, and the book I'm reading, the next one, a book I'm reading is, is Fear, and it's by the same doctor. And he talks about, you are fertile ground. You're a sponge in the spiritual dimension and in the thinking dimension. And then there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, 10 that says, there are, it may be, so many kind of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. So that tells you every voice you hear has a purpose and a design behind it. And the question is, what's driving that? And this has been really Im impactful for me because there's been someone in my life who I thought really cared for me uh, like a daughter, but I realized that the things that she was speaking into my life were trying to tap into maybe some of the traumas of my childhood. So the spirits that she dealt with was recognizing the spirit of fear, abandonment, and rejection in me. And those were trying to link up <laughs> to continue the cycle. And so every voice you hear has significance and every voice that you do or do not take into captivity according to the word of God will plant a seed and the seed will come to harvest. The question is, are we filtering it enough? And if, we, if there's a break in the filtration system in our mind, there's a break in the body somewhere corresponding. And I've got a friend who's got cancer too. And because he can't block the attacks that go on in his mind, there's a break in the lymphatic system, which is our cleansing of our blood. So there's a direct correlation between what we stop in our mind and in our heart and then how it affects our body so that was it and i'm gonna i want to i'm gonna jump on that real quick um you know what, what jim was saying was very important it's every voice that comes in your life i view it as a seed right and a seed is desiring soil and once planted desires a harvest um i will tell you that Kristen's um Kristen's dad was um uh, diagnosed with cancer went through the whole <clears throat> the whole deal as far as dealing with it and um you know, I think it was prostate cancer, I ended up having it removed. And, but the, the, the question was, did it escape? And Christian, I could be wrong because I'm not a doctor. Did it es escape the region of the prostate and get into other areas of, of his body? And so what he was doing is every couple months, he would get tests, blood tests to see what the levels were. And I remember going to his laptop Every month you could see a chart and you could see whatever levels that trigger cancer started going up. And this after a couple of years started going up, up, up and up. And there is a ceiling that once it breaks through, you know, as far as I don't know if it's your white blood cells or what have you. But once it breaks through, then ultimately you have cancer again. It's back and it's no longer in remission and you're going to have to go back to radiation and all this other stuff. And I remember I don't know if it's been a few years what actually had happened. But I remember the Lord spoke to me loud and clear. 
And he said, I'm giving him at least 15, a 15 year extension on his life. So I went over there and he's talking about his cancer and I'm looking at this thing. And, you know, he's looking at this screen every single day that's saying you're eventually going to die. And I came over with a contradictory word and I told him, I said, the Lord told me you, he's giving you at least a 15 year extension on your life. And here's the crazy thing for, for a couple months, you see this line going up on the computer screen. Well, the next month after I released that word in his life, that line that was going like this went straight down to normal and started growing straight. And he didn't take any type of medication or anything differently, but it showed me that he must have listened to that word because he grabbed hold of it because all of a sudden everything corrected itself because he was believing the lie, which empowers a liar. And it came down. My dad had um, a brain cancer, uh, my stepdad, and he had a tumor that was cancerous that was going from the back of his eye all the way into his brain. The doctors were uh, told to go ahead and cut it out. So they had to remove the eye. So the instruction of the surgery, again, Kristen, I don't know protocol, but in the surgery, they were instructed to take out the eye because the eye was cancerous. So was the tumor that was going back in his brain. So I went over to his house and he's kind of a man's man. And, you know, so am I. And, and so I said, Hey, you know, I got a word for you. And he goes, what, what's that? I said, God told me if, if, if uh, he saved one righteous man, which is Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah, that he would save you one righteous man from the spirit of cancer. And so he kind of looked at me, he's expecting prayer and all this other stuff. He goes, is that it? I said, that's it. What did they do? I sowed a seed that contended with the cancer. And it was a rhema word. It was a word that was from God. Now, two days later, I came back and I said, I want to pray for your eye real quick. He seemed real awkward. And, you know, he's not in church, but he seemed real awkward. But, you know, he believes in Jesus. So I said, hey, let me pray for you real quick. He's looking at his chair, looking at me. I said, man, I'm not going to hug on you. I'm not going to cry over you. I said, just a point of contact. I want to confess something. So I put my hand on his face and I rebuke cancer. And it was a very quick prayer. I left it alone. And then Kristen, you were there. We went to the beach house over the weekend. My mom calls. <clears throat> he was going in for a surgery. It's, they said it's going to take four hours to take the eye out, to take the cancer out. So they ended up taking the eye out. But my mom said, it's not a four hour surgery. It was 45 minutes. And, and she goes, you know why I'm calling, don't you? I said, I know why you're calling. And she goes, why am I calling? I said, you're calling me to tell me they couldn't find the cancer. She goes, Greg, what the heck is going on? She says, it's mass. It exists. She goes, how does it just disappear? I said, I don't know, mom. She goes, well, they removed the eye, but there was no cancer. And I said, well, praise God. So uh, the cancer that was growing in his brain was gone, right? So it was getting a voice, which was the voice of God is the seed of God's word, which is life, which the Bible says in Isaiah 55 and 11, that if you send that word, it won't return to your void. It will accomplish its goal and it will prosper in the area that you send it to. It says that the angels of the Lord hearken to the word of God or the command of God. It says in Jeremiah 1 and 12 that God watches over his word to perform it. What are we talking about? Well, Jen just said, hey, you got to have this filter in your heart. You have to challenge these words. You have to challenge these worldly conditions. How? By the word of God. And if I get a word that's straight from the, the throne of grace, I start laughing because it's done, right? No word from God will ever fail, uh, uh, Luke 1 and 37. So I know that if God spoke it, he's going to perform it. The question is, what is God saying about the topic? Let's move on. So we understand that voices are seeds. Now um, let's talk about temptation because I'm going to take it back to the medical arena. What the Bible calls temptation, the medical world calls uh, a medical psychological defect like anxiety or depression. So cortisol regulates blood pressure, the immune function, and then the inflammatory response. It helps the body respond to stress and then returns to normal. When a person constantly deals with fear, anxiety, and depression, cortisol levels remain high and elevated. It creates additional anxiety, which leads to autoimmune disorders, uh, to include digestive disorders and immune deficiencies, heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes. So one of the recommendations, I went on to a, a whatever doctor site that Google ranked number one, it says if you have high cortisol levels, it says, yeah, that there's treatment, uh, you know, with, with, with medicine, but it also says the next thing we do is we suggest that you meditate. And I'm like, interesting. So we're talking about a source of meditation is the place of creativity. But even the doctors say, even with a psychological disorder, we encourage you to meditate at least 10 minutes a day. 
And why do you meditate? They said, we want you to meditate for self-acceptance. Why? Because you have an identity issue. Well, hold on a sec. You're kind of contradicting yourself. So you're saying that I have a psychological disorder because I don't know who I am. And you want me to meditate to find out who I am and to get secure in that. Yes. Okay. Well, I know who I am. I was created in the image of God. In the image of God, God created me. Jesus died for my sins. I've accepted his death. I've accepted his blood. And I've been adopted into sonship. Now I know who I am, right? I'm not named by addiction. I'm not named by sickness. I'm named son of God, right? And so even the medical field says, we want you. Oh, there we go. Jen, you said the flood of cortisol level break down white T blood cells. Those are defenders that identify and attack disease, ABS, and cancer. Interesting. So Thank you. Um, it's actually and cancer. Sorry. Autocrat. And cancer. Okay. Not You're just typing too fast. And if you <laughs> want to talk about it, let me know. So we have to understand, again, when somebody comes in for deliverance in the house, right? Like I said in the very beginning, all of a sudden pain starts shooting through their body that they did not know they have. What's happening? I'm disrupting the harvest. When I'm dealing with the spirit of infirmity, which it is a spirit that's manifesting as sickness in the flesh, and all of a sudden you got pain moving around your body, which is a tormenting spirit or affliction. And we're driving it out and we're driving out that infirmity. We are disrupting the harvest of it, right? Well, how are we disrupting the harvest? It's actually through repentance and forgiveness, but ultimately we're driving that thing out and we're disrupting a harvest. So I don't think it's strange that anybody that even though they've gone to a doctor and they seem normal, then these pains start arising in their body. I believe it's on its way to a manifestation, right? And a harvest. So anyways, so I think it's interesting that doctors are saying, hey, go meditate and get some self-acceptance. Now watch this. First John 2 and 16, I got like two more points and I'm done. First John 2 and 16 says, for all that is in the world, watch this, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the life and pride of life, it's not from the father, but it's of the world. If it's of the world, it's of the God of the world, it's the enemy. So we have the desires of the flesh or the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, these three things I'm telling you right now are the attacks of the enemy. Watch this. So the lust of the flesh. In Luke 4 and 3, Dave, uh, the devil told Jesus to command the stone to become bread. Think about this. It's saying that there's a lust of the flesh. You have a hunger. Well, let's just go ahead and satisfy it. So he wanted to satisfy a hunger apart from God. All of these things are apart from God. Now, it came from the devil, and I'm going to tell you why the devil does this. So, go satisfy your hunger. Well, I'm lonely. I'm hungry. I'm broke. I'm this, that, and the other thing. Well, he'll present something right in front of you that's going to satisfy your wound. What did you say? Yeah, he's going to give you something that is going to satisfy your wound. Interesting. Attack of the enemy. Second thing, lust of the eyes. Luke 4 and 5, the devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. <clears throat> so he was trying to impress him with all of the kingdoms of the earth, lust of the eyes. Do I drive the right car? Do, do you know, am I skinny enough? Can I fit in these jeans? You know, am I living in the right house? Do I have the right job? It's all the lust of the eyes, right? Uh, and the pride of life. Luke 4 9, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point in the temple, told him to throw himself down and God would rescue him interesting. Go ahead and throw yourself down. God's going to rescue us. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. God's grace will forgive you. Oh, wow. So what this is doing, when he told Jesus to do it, it's saying you can operate independent of God. God's always going to forgive you. You can do whatever you want to do. And you can't. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, my food, the thing that sustains me, is to do the will of the one who sent me. That's his food, right? And now the enemy is saying, go do what you want to do. You can always repent. God always accept you back, right? But where there's a seed, there's going to be a harvest. So there is consequence, right? And God and, and repentance is available for the willing heart. It's just not an equation where you say, God, forgive me, and it's over. No, there's got to be a willingness to change. A repentance is saying, I'm going to return. I'm going to change the direction that I was going, and I'm going to get on a different path. So why would the enemy hit you with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Because that's the very thing that got him kicked out of heaven. The first attack on humanity was the attack of Adam and Eve in the garden. How did he attack them? Lust of the flesh. 
He dealt with their hunger issue, with, with the fruit of the tree. He dealt with the lust of the eyes. You'll know the knowledge of good and evil. And he dealt with the pride of life. You will be independent from God. You're going to know everything. You're going to be awesome. And God's going to respond to every beck and call. Why did he trap her? Because I think he wanted to show God that even the children of God will do the same thing he did if given the right, uh, given the right circumstance, that they will fall to temptation. Now, all of a sudden, there's this frustration when the enemy tries to hit us with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. We respond just like Jesus did. Say, that doesn't feed, that doesn't feed me you know, lust of the flesh, you know, this appetite, I need this relationship, I need this, I need this, no, I need to get healed first, you know, uh, and, and for me, my rejection issue, I carried around uh, until I was a pastor, right, actually, it was about four years ago, so I carried this thing around, but rejection determined how I fed myself, right, that's why I believe that there was limited power flowing in my life, because I was feeding myself with the wrong things based on rejection issue, because I saw everything through rejection, rejection was the very lens I looked at everything through. And I already predetermined, and I was prejudiced because I already had a decision of what people thought about me before I even met them, that they see me as a lesson. Why? Because that's the way rejection sees. So what do you do? Because I saw myself through the lens of rejection, then I see everything else. And what do I do? I try and feed that thing. What did I do? I spent all my time in the gym. I'm like, well, people won't reject me if I'm 220 pounds and I'm benching 430 pounds, you know, and I got the right job and I'm doing the right thing. And, but these are all physical things, right? I'm trying to look my, make myself acceptable physically, you know, with the right car, with the right job and all this other stuff before I even deal with my heart issue. It doesn't work that way. You got to deal with the heart issue first and whatever manifests in your heart is going to manifest in your life. That's why we got to guard our heart. Proverbs 4 and 23, right? So those are the three things that the enemy caused him to fall. And these are the three attacks that the enemy puts on you through temptation. He first tries to get the lust of the flesh. And what does he do? It's bait to get you out of church, ultimately. And I'm gonna leave, it, leave that one alone, but it's always the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Philippians 4 and 8 says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, uh, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It also says meditate on these things. So God wants your meditation on things good. Why? So you can produce good things in your life. Matthew 13, 26, 28. Remember, we kind of got off that beaten path. We're in Matthew 13. So let's go back to that. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came to him and said, sir, you did not sow any good seed in your field. How then does it have tares? And he said to him, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? Now, later he says, no, hold on a sec. So the person that was sowing in the field, here's the key in this. He recognized it was the enemy. So let me stop here. He recognized it was the enemy. So I talked about God's voice and the devil's voice and your own voice. He recognized it was the enemy. So what can he do if he recognizes it is the enemy? Well, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says we're fighting a spiritual battle. And it says the weapons of our warfare, they're not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we're destroying sophisticated arguments. Watch this. Or imaginations. What does imagination do? It creates. So we're destroying an imagination that desires to create something in our life outside of God. And every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ, being ready to punish every act of disobedience. How do we punish it? We uproot it. We destroy the seed, right? We disconnect ourselves from it. And it says when our own obedience as a church is complete, think about this. It's saying our obedience has to be complete. So what is it talking about? It's talking about a process. Now, I want you to say, think about this. This process of renewing the mind and challenging the thoughts is a process. Keep with that thought. So we understand that this landowner recognized it was the enemy. And if he recognized it was the enemy, he couldn't stand, think about this, he couldn't stand uh, condemned. He couldn't be ashamed of himself. Um, he couldn't think less of, of himself. Why? Because he didn't take ownership over it. He said, that's not mine. He said, that's the enemy's. He said, the enemy's trying to take up seed in the heart of man. Look at the, the parable of the sower. 
the the word was sown uh, the good seed was sown among the thorns and the thistles right and what were the thorns and thistles it represented the cares of this world what are the cares of this world it's the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life so that's what it represented let me go a little bit further what do those things represent it represents something that serves you and not anybody else meaning it stops with you it doesn't serve anybody else so when i'm looking with the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and the pride of life i'm looking for my own fulfillment not for anybody else and that contradicts the kingdom because god will only get it to you if he knows he can get it through you god's excessive but he's not wasteful so we have this landover that recognized that wasn't you know my voice that was the voice of the enemy that tried to get sown in, the, in my heart so i can't stand condemned i can't stand shame i can't be shamed um i can't be judged because it wasn't my voice see here's the thing with this verse in second corinthians 10 3 and 6 it's talking about imagination and it's talking about a repetitious cycle that's negative that's ingrained in your life which is called a stronghold that's been operating in your life and it's saying that we have to destroy it well we first have to recognize that the word of god will separate it's living and active um you know hebrews 4 and 12 it will separate it but we first have to recognize that this isn't god's voice and these thoughts in my head are not god's voice and they're not my voice so why are you taking ownership over it and why are you feeling so bad about yourself when you now know that those aren't my thoughts those are the enemy's thoughts what is your job to do your job is to first off recognize it second off confront it what do i confront it with i confront it with the word of god how did Jesus confront it? What does the word of God say about the crazy thought that just came in your head? And you need to speak to it because when you speak to it, the word of God will destroy that thing, right? Now watch this. So we have to consider the origin of every thought we have. We have to consider every emotion, every feeling, every picture, and everything that surges through our consciousness. We have to now evaluate it. And we have to ask ourselves, where did it come from? I read a statistic that said that 3% of people think about what they think about. So we now have to think about these thoughts. Where did it come from? We have to actually challenge it, and we use it for a gift of discernment. Hebrews 5 and 14, it says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice, constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we have to train it by constant practice. So what's constant practice? I have to continue to evaluate my thought process and I have to ask myself, where did this thing come from? And I have to challenge it. Is this from God? Well, was this a spontaneous thought, picture, and emotion? And what am I meditating on? Well, I'm meditating based on my feeling on something that was sown. What was the cause? What came in and what started this negative cycle? I got to go back and I got to repent for that. I got to change my mind about it through the word of God. I got to speak to that issue and let it know you no longer have authority. I have to create separation. And I have to forgive myself for receiving it. And forgiveness separates that issue uh, from not just me, but from God. And God says, I'll separate as far as east is to west. I'll create so much separation that you will not remember it anymore. So I have to work to get this thing out of my life. Now, in Matthew 13, 29 through 30, but he said, no, for while you were gathering the tares, they asked, should we uproot it? He said, no, while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them, allow both to grow together until the harvest. Until the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. So we know that this, this practicing, this perfecting, this completing, it's all a process. But he said, wait to the harvest. Why? Because evil had not manifested into that person's life yet. And they wanted the harvest to come because not only was evil manifesting right and when it manifests it manifests in the flesh starts off in a spiritual condition then soul then flesh it manifests in the flesh but the grace of god has been perfected as well so once the grace of god is perfected then i can uproot it and get rid of it why because now i have grace for it and i can lean on the grace more than i can for the lust of the flesh for the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I don't need that stuff anymore because grace has done its work in my life and it's been perfected in my life. First John 4, 18, watch this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, perfect love casts out fear. 
For fear is to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. <clears throat> so it says perfect love casts out fear. Now, perfect love comes from God, and we are to love God and love ourselves. But this is a process. A perfecting is a process. So the more you perfect yourself in love through the word of God, the more fear will be driven out of your life. And God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Second Timothy 1 and 7. And it is a spirit, but the word of God, by the spirit of God, will be the bully and drive that thing out of your life. Last scripture. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You'll be able to test and approve. I think testing, now, every time you think testing, think of the fire of God. <clears throat> you'll be able to test and approve. You'll not only test it, put it in the fire, but you'll be able to approve it. That even after the storm, it's still going to stand. That's your experience. That's the thing that's going to make you free. And you'll be able to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Did I say perfection is a process? Yes. But when you go through this process of perfection, it will be made complete so you can walk out his perfect will. It is a process. So what's happening in this parable? This parable is talking about a person working out their salvation. It's saying, hey, I acknowledge that there's some imperfections in my life, but I'm going to continue to grow in grace. And once this grace is made perfect, then I'm going to start plucking things out. That's why I say deliverance is a process. It's like peeling back the layers of the onion. Once grace is perfected in a certain area, then God will go ahead and rip those things out of your life. There's certain people that come in for deliverance and God's not ready to get it all out of your life because grace has not been made perfect in your life and you will not be able to stand. But once grace is perfected through your repentance, through forgiveness, through your love of self, because of your love of God, then God can say, now I can remove that thing from your life. Well, God, why have you not removed it from my life yet? Because you haven't been made perfect in love yet in that area. You haven't been made perfect in grace in that area. When you are made perfect in that area, then God will address it and he will remove it from your life. Until then, he'll allow it to grow until grace is made perfect in your life and it can be uh, uprooted and, and taken up and out of your life. That's all I got for you guys today. Uh, Jen, do you have anything? Kristen, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I just wanted to go back um, and go a little deeper on talking about the cortisol you were talking about as far as what happens when we're letting that fear in, spiritual colliding with physical or medical in, you know, in my world. Um, when you have that state of fear rather than cortisol which is a hormone being triggered during that fight or flight mode um if you're living in that constant state of fear and you're not dealing with what caused the fear or how to uproot it um and allowing that grace in like you were just saying um your body is going to continue to dump that cortisol hormone in and, and like Jen, Jen was saying, how it goes after your white blood cells, um, cortisol is glucose, it's sugar. And so not only is it killing white blood cells, but it's also allowing bacteria to breed. If you think about when you've got like a head cold or something and you um, aren't supposed to eat any sugar or anything because that's just gonna breed the bacteria more and give it something to feed off of. Well, evil spirits, anything, you know, the enemy, it's going to breed off of that cortisol. Sorry, Asher and Kenzie are getting excited because I'm talking. Um, <laughs> they want to be on TV too. <laughs> so when you're breeding some, just like cortisol is breeding bacteria and killing white blood cells, it's allowing the infirmities to grow. And what's diabetes? It's the sugar disease, right? And so you're higher risk for diabetes. But when your body is just constantly in that state of fear, cranking out that cortisol, it's not just causing diabetes. It's causing, it's causing everything else. It's causing Crohn's disease, um, irritable bowel syndrome, 
Hashimoto's disease. I mean, any autoimmune disease you can think of, you know, um, fibromyalgia, and I'll have Jen talk a little bit more about fibromyalgia, um, anything like that, it's just like, it's gonna ex just expedite it and kick it into high gear because you're allowing the enemy to constantly speak that fear into your life. So yeah, I'll let Jen talk because she was trying to chime in as well when I spoke. So go ahead, Jen. Hey, Kristen, first off, I wanted to say all that stuff, but that's your gift. So that was awesome. Well, I know. I thought you were going to have me come in and talk about it when you were talking about cortisol. So does cortisol, now let me ask you this. Does cortisol also aid in weight gain, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's why, I mean, obviously there's poor diets here, but there's higher stress. We work ourselves to death here and in America. And so that's why there's more obesity in America now versus a hundred years ago. Hmm. Is not just the poor diet, but the level of stress that we put on it. And so we're just dumping those sugars into our body constantly, running on adrenaline. Okay. So take the Skittles out of my nightstand. I don't need them anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. I just wanted to share something real quickly about um, my experience when I recently had really bad inflammation in my arm. And it was so bad that a doctor prescribed a steroid and that was to help bring the inflammation down. But here's the thing, the steroid also spikes cortisol levels. So the thing they were trying to treat was actually triggering the source of it to start back all over again. And it's kind of amazing how you can go to a doctor and the thing that they're trying to treat is taking you right back into a circle. So I was, already, I was having a ton of cortisol being dumped in my system, which was triggering inflammation just to go rampant in my body so much that it hurt so bad. I couldn't move my arm. And then they gave me something that brought the inflammation down, but triggered cortisol again. So you could go to people in the medical field and some of them are highly trained, but they're not understanding what's starting the cycle. So I was just sharing that experience. A lot of times we think when we go to the doctor that they have things, but it's not really ready yet. So, um, hey guys, uh, quick thing I'm just gonna share for fibromyalgia. <laughs> Hang on, sorry, my dogs are excited. <laughs> um, fibromyalgia is a stress and anxiety disorder. It's classic symptoms are pain in the muscles, ligaments and connective tissue fatigue and chronic insomnia. Women make up 99% of the people who are diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And it talks about how it affects females who don't feel covered, protected, nurtured, or safe, and are always looking over their shoulder. They're driven, anxious, moving from the pieces of their life around, trying to find some security or stability that they feel is not coming from their husbands or fathers. In most cases, such a woman has had the burden of the world on her shoulders. She has been the one leading the home spiritually, taking care of the kids, attending to the finances, and perhaps dealing with reoccurring crises in the home itself. She has been carrying all the burden herself because a man in her life will not take care of any of these needs. As a result, she has gone down under the burden. That was it. I just wanted to share that. Oh, that's kind of a pretty big bomb you just dropped. <laughs> That, you know, and that's, and that's huge, you know, and, and, you know, I know that we, we've talked about this in raising, uh, I, I think in giant killers, you know, I talked about the role of the husband is to love his wife and it doesn't exempt him from the running of the family, but the wife controls the atmosphere of the home, you know, and that's something that, you know, when a, a single mom is, is carrying those burdens, man, it's, it's tough. And that's where we got to rely on the love of God, you know, um, it's it's huge because what is is sown in you know a woman's life not only you know affects the atmosphere of the people around her but it also that's where it talks about the bitter root judgment is every source of evil uh which means it afflicts many um you know it's it's one of those issues that yeah it it not only affects the people around you it affects you physically and so you know you know going back to one of the healings that we saw you know, about a month ago was, you know, with this lady with arthritic pain, you know, in her back. And I knew that, that she had, uh, there you go, spiritual root behind fibromyalgia is fear, stress, anxiety, um, 
I think you said drowsiness and, and something else, but it was no coincidence. Drivenness. It, drivenness. What, what is it? It's drivenness. Drivenness is rooted in fear that I need to, I need to go take care of myself rather than allow God to have oh. faith. So drivenness drives women to the edge of trying to take care of everything all at once. And perfectionism and perfectionism is also rooted in rejection, you know, which yeah. is also rooted in heaviness, which is an oppressive spirit. So anyways, that's, that's, that's good stuff. But, you know, we, we have to realize that, uh, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, w- we have to realize that, you know, with the women in the house is, you know, that atmosphere is crucial. It's crucial for the kids. It's crucial for the people around, uh, you because, you know, we don't need the bitterness. We don't need the rejection, you know, in our children, um, because we'll actually, instead of trying to help them, we'll drive them back in the same thing that, you know, that, that drove us, but, um, you know, and, and ultimately again, you know, not to create fear, but there, there's a cause and, you know, going back to that, that's what it was going back to that lady with the arthritic pain in her back. You know, that's something that she carried for 16 years and she'd been at the church and people had prayed for. Her. And I sat there and think about this and we're going to wrap this call. Think about this when somebody has been prayed th- for three, four, five times, and they're not getting healed, then you got to start asking the question, well, what's the reason for these calls? Well, the reason for these calls is to just start asking questions. You know, if you've prayed for this person, now I've prayed for several people that that have had terminal cancer, that have had tumors. Um, I've seen signs, wonders, and workings of miracles, but I've also seen people that have not been healed. Now, if I pray for somebody with cancer and they get healed, that's awesome. But now, if that person doesn't get healed, um, somebody's got an issue in in their left wrist that God's healing right now. But if 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 that person does not get healed, then the reason we're doing these calls is so you can start asking questions. And you know, all of us are reading you know these books by you know Dr. Henry Wright. Jen's a little bit further, um, just because she works at Amazon. I guess she gets privileges and gets the books first. I'm just messing with you. But but you know. We started going down this thing with the altar. Then we started going into deliverance and we started going into healing. Then all of a sudden we started having these experiences where every time we called out infirmity, it was attached to a physical issue that was not a known, but was manifesting in that person's life. When we confronted it, then it was just like, well, hold on a sec. If everything has a cause and if we're a spirit with a soul in a flesh suit, then I have to diagnose what's in my flesh suit. I got to walk it backwards and find out where was that cause. So once we started doing this, we started seeing people get healed in, you know, deliverance sessions, in prayer. So it's not the fact that, well, you know, that God doesn't heal. It's sometimes people are holding on to issues that are unknown because the depths of a person's heart is unsearchable, Proverbs 25 and 3. And all we're doing is we're doing a little bit of digging finding out the clause and we're closing the door. But I, the reason I told this, this story about the tears is the perfecting of grace in your life is a process. The Bible says you reap a harvest if you don't give up. Uh, I think it's Galatians 6 and 8. So we have to understand that this is a process and the process is being worked out is your perfection. Why? So you can prove the word of God in not just your life, but in the lives of people around you. So I just, I, I appreciate the information, you know, Jen, uh, Kristen, you are a huge asset as well. Um, cause she knows this stuff. She'll just kind of just spit it out. And I'm like, I get a word of knowledge. Someone's got pain. I Kristen, and I'm, a, I'm like, what's that? Kristen won't even just tell me what it is. She'll tell me where it comes from. And then it helps me to diagnose the cause. So if they don't get restored in that area, then I know the area that we can actually go after. And that's why, you know, I believe the, these girls have been so effective in inner healing is because they know what it they know what it is, but they know what causes it. And that's all we're doing is we're just kind of, you know, we, we initially said, let's just take the emotion and tie it to the strong man. Now let's take the physical symptom and let's also tie it to the strong man that, you know, through a lie that somebody's believed or through a trauma that they've experienced and we can go ahead and reverse that. So Anyways, that's all I got. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give some analysis. So I'm going to stop the recording. Um, 